Okay, good morning. Um, see, uh, today we will um, discuss on uh, some additional uh, aspects uh, that contributes for uh, understeer gradient. Uh, that uh, already that we have seen. Apart from only tire consideration, we have uh, seen that the understeer gradient, uh, even in steady state cornering, is get influenced by a suspension system. Because the moment you have to account the suspension, the real uh, uh, response of your vehicle can be realized in our model. And that is the role of vehicle body. And the role of vehicle body would cause uh, lateral load transfer as well as uh, there will be uh, that is going to influence the camber change. So these two uh, uh, camber change and lateral load transfer, how are they going to contribute towards understeer gradient is what we have seen in the previous class. And today we will see the other additional uh, aspects, right? Uh, apart from camber change, we also have seen something in the last class, roll steer. This roll steer is because of vehicle body roll. One is lateral load transfer, another one is as the body roll, you also have uh, the uh, steering effect in the wheel. And that is uh, called roll steer. As body rolls, the uh, steer, uh, uh, wheels are getting steered and that steering effect is what is called a roll steer effect and we have also seen that in the last class. So today we will see the rest of the um, uh, responses that we have uh, at the end uh, said that uh, one is uh, what is the lateral force combined steer? What do you mean by that? And then uh, let us look at what do you, what is the effect due to aligning tar and what is the effect due to steering system and most importantly uh, what would happen if motion itself is uh, changing from its steady state? That means there will be a tractive force uh, that is acting on the wheels. What would happen? So these are all something that I would be uh, uh, teaching in this period and concluding uh, this module. And then we will be left with only vertical dynamics part. And uh, I would uh, um, post the video lectures of mine for that. You are expected to go through that uh, yourself in this uh, uh, week ahead. And once we come back, maybe we may uh, clarify some of your doubts or I would be um, reviewing your J component. <laughs> also, as far as this J component assessment is concerned, out of 13 batches, uh, there are nine batches only have submitted and there are four batches to submit. Group one has sent the detail, but I am not able to open that file. So including group one, group eight, nine and 13. These are the four groups yet to submit their uh, uh, J component report uh, should mail me and other groups, whatever you have sent. I've been going through and uh, now I have finished uh, going through uh, two papers only, but uh, I have glanced through all you have submitted. I am not uh, very much happy that I will not be. Uh, no, uh, it takes more time for me to go and uh, my correction giving their modifying paper is not possible for uh, at least to communicate. That's what I feel. So I'm going to give you a task now. Uh, as far as the J component is concerned. So at least uh, five members are there in a group. So the first author, uh, whoever's name is there in that, uh, is communicated to me the um, uh, paper. So the remaining students supposed to read the paper and everyone should come out with at least five to 10 questions that you are going to ask uh, uh, about the paper. And you have to review among yourself and I am going to take your review. That would be considered a second or final review all. Every group has to present to me. I would ask that every member has read and what all the questions that you arise that you don't follow of the paper what you have submitted. So that would help you to give a kind of exercise that every member in the group would understand what is that status of your J component, right? And then it is easy for me to give a comment. Otherwise, I just sit and keep reading it and I'm not able to make it as a communicatable paper that that requires longer time. At least uh, this J component should have given you a kind of uh, <coughs> practice that if you have to focus on a particular topic and you take up a project and how do you have to draft your understanding of your project and draft your literature understanding nicely so that uh, the community uh, when you publish uh, is going to read uh, would be benefited and the reviewer would be feeling to read the paper and give a good comments. Otherwise, it is at the first site itself uh, insufficient, not suitable for the uh, <laughs> journal and so on, get rejected. So that's what I have gone through. Uh, there are two papers, at least they have formatted 
two three papers i have seen that it's formatted properly but uh, still uh, there are a lot of comments that from my side i was really uh, struggling with uh, correcting those things so what am i suggesting is i would give a schedule next week i'll call or maybe i will post in my team the schedule for your j component that uh, meeting hours of individual group and when you meet uh, it is mandatory that uh, one or two would be presenting remaining four in the group should be questioning them so that's what is the exercise so the best group coming out of having full clarity of your work would be uh, given a higher mark compared to the others so relative performance i'm going to do like that so instead of me sitting and struggling with that and may not be able to communicate to you i suggest now that every member in a group should read it of course the one who has communicated i presume that he has composed read through all <coughs> collecting the information from others contribution all so every member should read and i would be asking you the question after i listen to you how your two members are presenting other four will be acting as a reviewer and uh, do that so how can it be possible this everyone should read your paper once again and write down your questions that you don't follow what you have written and ask that during the review so this is the exercise that we are going to do and that would benefit rather i am sitting and reading it right so this is a part now let us get into our lecture and uh, today's lecture may be the last lecture of this and i will post uh, maybe five to six lectures whatever is necessary for vertical dynamics uh, uh, in the uh, ms teams in our lecture channel you can go through that during this week and uh, that would complete your syllabus and uh, whatever is necessary that once we come back we have uh, three more lectures on june uh, june second i think june again fourth and then june seven so at that time we will those three periods will make yourself effectively from what you have listened from the lecture your j component all right so that is how our course going to end for the semester and uh, whatever that video lectures i am posting that is also there for your final assessment examination vertical dynamics part also is there for your examination so please go through those videos what i am going to post and that completes uh, our syllabus right so today's lecture is um, uh, at most you can consider to be the last lecture for this module and uh, the remaining lectures we will go through uh, three lectures is for our revision or your doubts to clarify and so on right with that note let me just get into today's lecture let me share my screen you have anything to ask you can please ask at this moment any clarification anything if not then we will get into a lecture later on we can discuss so hope you are you are able to see this in the last class this is what we have seen that uh, as a body role there would be change in camber addition to whatever the design camber uh, that's given to the uh, wheels uh, that's called uh, camber angle with respect to vehicle body right and uh, you get an additional uh, uh, camber change uh, that is taking place because of that and uh, that contribution is what first we have seen and uh, you see that the term 3 here is due to camber and uh, uh, that depends upon uh, again the roll rate and the roll rate depends upon again the roll angle a uh, roll angle depends upon roll rate and this camber change depends upon roll rate you could say right and then we have seen uh, what is this roll steer effect roll steer effect to define we have defined this roll steer coefficient which is again uh, defined as the steer effect due to uh, roll per degree roll right uh, so that is considered to be positive wheel steers to the right in the right hand roll that means the vehicle takes a left turn so we have de defined that uh, the understeer effect 
otherwise it is called an oversteer effect if uh, uh, vehicle takes a right turn and uh, uh, when it is steered to right and uh, you your, uh, your vehicle rolls left then that effect would be uh, wheels rolls left uh, then uh, that effect would be uh, oversteer effect and uh, that can be assumed in a rear axle that uh, as a trailing arm orientation so this is what we have seen finally the expression k uh, uh, understeer gradient into roll steer can be given by this difference in uh, the coefficients in front axle and rear axle and that's again function of uh, a roll rate that's why it's multiplied by roll rate right and this is what uh, uh, we have seen in the last class and uh, let us do now uh, these are the four items now so let's start with the uh, uh, lateral force combined steer and then uh, these are all simple uh, i'm not going to go more in detail maybe we will do a derivation for variation in tractive force this in detail the other three are physically you should understand uh, how this understeer gradient get influenced by these aspects, right? So let's go to lecture number 41. And the first one is lateral force combined steer. Lateral force compliance. It's not a compliance, compliance steer, right? Mm -hmm. steer. Yeah. So, see, this is because of there is a lateral force that developed in the wheels uh, that's due to the uh, bushings that are provided in steering and uh, suspension system. So, this bushes uh, uh, would have some flexibility in lateral direction. As you steer your vehicle during cornering, what would happen is that creates lateral force uh, in the axles and that uh, would create the steer effect in your uh, uh vehicle wheels so that is uh, going to contribute towards uh your understeer gradient so what would happen uh, let us look at the vehicle uh, rear axle i'm going to look at vehicle rear axle in this way so let us understand beforehand what does this understeer and oversteer effect though we are knowing let us just uh, try to recollect that right so if you look at, uh, this is my front axle wheel and uh, this is my rear axle wheels. And I, I do take a turn, say, to the right now. If these wheels are steered outward, if front wheels are steered outward, that means I have to give more steering. That is going to be an understeer effect, right? So if these wheels are steered like this, I have to give her more steering and then uh, it will uh, go, or this axle is drifting out and then I have to correct it, uh, then it is understeer effect. The same um, would happen how here, uh, see uh, uh, if this uh, wheels are turned to this inside like this, then Rear wheels are turning like that, that is going to again push it uh, outward, that is going to be an understeer effect. The same way, suppose there is a steer effect in this wheel, the similar fashion in this fashion, what would happen? That would try to push the forward of the vehicle inward to the curvature and that would contribute towards oversteer effect. So for understeer, this is understeer effect, here it, it has to go correspondingly in this fashion. If these wheels are steered like that, so this goes and this also assists. <coughs> now, this entire axle turn is going to be how it's because of uh, the center about which this axle is turning. So what is that center? That center would be um, uh, like, like this. So now let us look at an individual axle and say that axle is uh, your uh, rear axle, right? So I have my wheel. And this is only axle and here I have uh, this differential. So maybe uh, this is your rear axle. So in this rear axle, because of this uh, uh, suspension, 
uh, Bush's compliance, there would be lateral force that would be developed and that lateral force uh, would make this axle to turn uh, with respect to a point called the yaw center. This yaw center will be in front of this rear axle and then what will happen, this entire uh, unit would be turned like this. This will turn like this. If this turns like this, uh, uh, if this turns like this, uh, so this is the turn. So if this turns like this. What will happen? You will have here this forces, lateral force developed, would be one as in this and the other here like this. This force is what is uh, the cornering force and this is uh, for the deflected condition you get a cornering force like this then uh, uh, this would create what an understeer if this is for a rear axle if this happens here what would happen this understeer effect would be uh, changed in the rear axle this wheels would go the front wheel will be pushed here so the vehicle would be more of oversteer tendency Over the tendency. If the same uh, happened, this yaw center happens to be on the rear side of the uh, rear axle. It's the same. I have it here. But my yaw center, instead of lying in front of this, in front of this, it lies here somewhere. Then what would happen is the change, uh, this gate orientation change. This is going to have a yaw rotation. In the top, you could see that it's going to be like that, and you will have your corresponding uh, cornering force now in this way, and uh, this way is a different. This is a deflected condition, so there is no force here. There's a net cornering force in this direction. Now it is in this direction. What would happen? Uh, it will be. Uh, it will be uh, contributing in this way. That's what is uh, going to be an understeer. Understeer contribution. So the same uh, uh, would be opposite in the front axle. So when this turns like that, this axle orientation turns like that. What does that mean? You have your yaw center behind here in the front axle. And that contributes to the so if this is for rear axle that you have seen, if it is for front axle, you would see that that exactly going to be opposite, opposite. So the yaw center would be here and then uh, uh, this uh, deflection of your axle in this way, uh, steering your wheels outward the turn, then it is going to be an understeer effect. And uh, if uh, uh, if this happens to be in front, then the entire thing would be turning like that, and then it is going to be an oversteer effect, right? So here it's all with respect to yaw center. In the rear axle, if yaw center is in front of the axle, that contributes to oversteer. Whereas so the same uh, in the uh, Front axle, if it is behind the axle, then it contributes to understeer, right? That you have to understand. For oversteer to contribute, this would be in front. For oversteer to contribute, the yaw center should be in front. So this is to account. Uh, let us define a coefficient, appropriate coefficient. Uh, let me call that as coefficient A. So this coefficient A is defining this tier effect uh, due to compliance here. So I put this subscript C that referred to compliance here due to bushes. So you may ask how this yaw center can be in front or behind. It depends upon the bushes. It depends upon the compliance present. So the compliance present in the suspension of the rear axle may make your yaw center either to go in front or back when it happens. Similarly, in the front. Uh, front wheels, uh, the bushes in the steering as well as suspension may make uh, the uh, yaw center of the front axle may be behind the axle or in front of the axle. So if it is happened to be behind the axle, uh, then it is going to uh, go for an understeer effect. 
if it happens to be in front of the axle, then it is going to be a oversteer. So whatever that one you remember, just opposite is what is happening into the other case. And that to account, let us define this coefficient A as steer per lateral force that is developed. The steer per uh, lateral force that is developed. This is Fy, this is Fy here. So uh, for this, uh, how much is developed? Um, it is degree steer by, it's both in degree angle. So degree steer per unit lateral force. So you can define it like that. So this is defined like that. I can say now what is the steer? See the steer effect is what is contributing towards your understeer gradient. That's what you have seen. So let's uh, now get to what is your steer uh, angle due to this compliance as A into Fy, where Fy would be uh, written as W uh, into Ay. Right, where Ay is in uh, uh, normalized. Ay is u squared by Rg. So this is uh, in general, then it will be uh, for a particular axle, then for a front axle, let me call that as delta CF, that's going to be AF, WF into AY. For a rear axle, uh, this uh, steer uh, would be by this coefficient AR times W into WR into AY. So the difference is what is going to give you your Compliance due to lateral force compliance here, and that would be AF minus AR, uh, AF WF minus AR WR into AY. So, so that is, uh, uh, see, uh, it won't come, this AY won't come. Because AY would be with the steer angle. It's a steer angle. This AY would not come uh, and you have to represent as an understeer gradient, right? Understeer gradient. So this is uh, the component that you have to account uh, for uh, the understeer effect that comes out from the compliance in the bushes that are provided for NVH purpose in the linkages of the suspensions. So uh, next one is what is aligning torque? So aligning torque, you know, aligning torque is the manifestation of the lateral force uh, resultant uh, not acting through the center of contact patch instead of it is just behind the uh, contact patch center. Right, and that uh, uh, pneumatic trail act as a moment arm that creates uh, uh, your aligning torque. This aligning torque always would resist the expected steering. Hence, uh, the aligning torque is always contributing to understeer gradient. Always contribute to understeer gradient. understeer gradient right and uh, uh, let me uh, put that expression aligning tar due to that so at refer to aligning tar and that would be w into p by l where this p is what is called pneumatic trail and it is uh, multiplied by c alpha f plus c alpha r by c alpha f into c alpha r where C alpha F and C alpha R, you know that they are, um, they are uh, stiffness of the tire, cornering stiffness of the tire, front axle tires and rear axle tires respectively. And P is what is pneumatic trail, L is wheel base, W is total load. So the aligning torque, uh, since this uh, P is positive, L is uh, dimension, and uh, here uh, C alpha F and C alpha R are always positive. And this would always contribute to a positive value of this. And this is what will be an addition to uh, our bicycle model when you have to account the self aligning torque also into your, um, uh, into your um, overall understeer gradient to calculate. So this uh, uh, is normally less than, if you look at this value, it's normally less than 0 0.5 uh, degrees to degrees per g. So the value that comes out from uh, the self-aligning torque 
generally it will be of 0.5 degrees per uh, G and that is multiple bilateral acceleration. So that much 0.5 degrees only uh, that comes, right? But you give your steering, that would be uh, more angle uh, required during cornering. So that contribution is very less. And uh, uh, similarly, if you look at from steering system, the understeer uh, gradient that comes from steering system is given by the expression. Let me write the expression first and then uh, we will understand what are those terms in that, right? So that is WF. Since the steering system is uh, for the front steered uh, vehicle in a passenger car, that comes out to be WF, the load in the front axle times R into nu plus P by CSS. -S. So in this, what is R is rolling radius. Of the tire. What is new is caster angle. What is P is pneumatic trail. And what is CSS is steering column stiffness, or steering system stiffness, steering stiffness. So you have your steering column, so that would have some stiffness that is. So uh, you should understand here how this is all coming. So you can refer to chapter number eight in uh, Jiller's speed textbook for steering system and uh, how can you derive this expression. But however, I'm not going to do that. You can just look at it and remember this formula. If data are given, you have to calculate this. You can use this formula straight away. By the way, we have looked at understood what is camber angle, but now what is this caster angle? So caster angle is uh, coming because of the geometrical aspect of the steering system uh, with respect to your uh, uh, wheel center. So for example, you look at, uh, how do you understand that is, uh, let me draw a steering uh, system representation with respect to a wheel. So this is center of the wheel, and I have here uh, the knuckle. So there is a uh, ball joints that comes from the uh, steering. There's a ball joint that comes from the steering. Uh, and uh, that comes and connected uh, one here as another upper uh, uh, pivot joint here. And you see that column inclination is defined by this. Join this. So this is your steering column inclination. So this is inside of your wheel. So this hub inside, so you say that's outside this one wheel. So if it is of uh, right uh, wheel, front right wheel, you can imagine. So this is going to have an intersection with the ground. Uh, you can see here, this is your contact patch. This is your contact patch. There is a center here. But this is uh, now uh, can be viewed. Uh, um, see, this is going to intersect somewhere here in the ground. So if I extend, this is my ground plane. So this is going to intersect somewhere here. So this angle would be uh, very, very uh, critical. See, you have to see this way. So it is the intersecting. It is intersecting uh, not uh, in the wheel plane. It's not parallel to wheel plane. It is at an angle to wheel plane. At the same time, it is uh, inclined to the vertical that is drawn from here. So let's look at there is a vertical here uh, to the center here. So there's a vertical here, right? There's a vertical here. So how do you define now your camber angle? And there is an another angle called a kingpin inclination angle. So for that, let us look at uh, this in two views. So let us look at in this front view as well as from this side view. So if I look at uh, this from side view, I would have now the steering column inclination goes like that to the ground. And that makes to the vertical this angle, which is called a uh, caster angle. Caster angle, right? And uh, similarly, if you look at uh, now uh, the front view like this, 
front tubes like this and this is your axis of the axle or the axis of the wheel and you see now your steering column would not be vertical it's instead uh, at an angle and that comes and hits the ground somewhere here and uh, this is center of the contact pipes there is an offset here that's what is called the kingpin offset or called the scrub so the smaller is better here so now uh, this angle to the uh, vertical is what is called uh, not cast uh, uh, angle it is uh, kingpin inclination angle given by lambda in in inclination angle right so uh, for your uh, uh, understeer effect uh, to get uh, you get your influence this is again positive quantity that would be um, brought here right so this is what uh, from the steering system so the more uh, uh, derivation or anything you have to again look at the steering system more in detail its kinematics all are important geometrical aspects all are important you can go through chapter number 8 in jillas speed textbook for further detail otherwise it's sufficient uh, even for exam point of view remembering this formula and explaining this whatever that i have done so far that's sufficient you can just brief it and uh, this you have seen self aligning torque and uh, um, steering system effect and uh, what is uh, compliance due to lateral force due to bushings in the nvh and uh, bushings for nvh purpose so this all uh, a part uh, these all are instantaneous these all effects come instantaneously during your cornering the cornering happens to be steady state cornering only but still these are all uh, will be accounted uh, along with your bicycle model wherein we consider only the linear tire model the moment you consider a non linear tire model and the suspension you allow the roll lateral load transfer takes place then you would have the change in the normal uh, uh, in uh, inner and outer wheels and that uh, change in uh, normal uh, fz is what is responsible for lateral load transfer due to understeer gradient that's first we have seen then we have looked at uh, due to the roll there is a camber change then we have also seen there is due to the roll there is a roll steer effect and uh, apart from these uh, uh, three you, today uh, uh, just we have uh, get across to these terms of uh, Uh, understeer gradient due to lateral force, uh, compliance steer, uh, uh, then uh, due to aligning torque, due to steering system. So these all are apart. If uh, the motion of your vehicle itself is undergoing uh, uh, away from steady state, that means you have your tractive force appearing uh, in your uh, wheels. Then what would happen? Is it going to influence on the uh, understeer effect? So that's what we will see now. And that is uh, called uh, on this. So effect of tractive force on cornering. Let us do that, and then that would be uh, over for this today's lecture. So this geometry of your bicycle model, you have to carefully understand for this. And uh, uh, I will do it if I make any mistakes. Please uh, kindly tell me that if I go wrong, because I see that when I derive, there is some change in the um, expression that is appearing in Gillespie textbook. From that, what I am deriving now, right? If I make a mistake, please tell me what am I doing uh, wrong here, <laughs> right? So. Um, this is the effect of tractive force on cornering effect of tractive force on cornering so let us look at this bicycle model uh, as this so a bicycle model i have uh, one line that represent my vehicle and uh, here i have my rear axle wheels collapse and made as one single wheel 
and in the front I have my steer tree. So if I extend this, and this is my wheel plane. And here, this is my wheel plane. Now, uh, this angle here is what is delta. So, the convention what I'm following here is SAE convention. So, SAE convention, you have your right hand, uh, three fingers, middle index and thumb finger stretched at 90 degrees, and you have to uh, look at like this. So, uh, your um, direction of positive x forward and positive y is towards the right, and positive z is downward. And angular measurement clockwise is positive. So, delta measured in this sense is positive. And since there is a cornering, you see that you know uh, you would have uh, you would have a slip angle developed. That would be here. So this is what is the actual wheel travel direction, and that is defined because of the slip angle alpha f. <laughs> and there is a slip angle here that is alpha r. And you also have a body slip angle. And your vehicle body velocity would be something. Uh, this uh, say this is capital V. That is your forward velocity. So this is what is uh, uh, the geometry of our bicycle model. So in this now uh, the forces developed are. I see how this is all. This all turns about an instantaneous center. So how do I get that? Is I would draw a line perpendicular to these vectors. And that would intersect at a point that is my instantaneous center. So these all are at 90 degrees. This is at 90 degrees, and this is at 90 degrees. So now your uh, uh, force Fy would be Fy uh, would be uh, at uh, perpendicular to this wheel plane. So perpendicular to this wheel plane means it is at uh, where it is uh, going to be acting here. It is going to be uh, along this perpendicular to this line. Let me draw that line. So this wheel plane. Uh, so uh, my Fy will be along this line. Uh, Fy will be along this line. So this is this is my lateral force in the front axis. Fy. Yeah. F Y F and F Y R here is in this direction. F Y R here is in this direction. F Y R is in this direction. Uh, Right, if I are in this direction, yeah. So, and uh, now tractive force. So let me consider it is acting on all the four wheels. So I would have front traction as well as in the rear also traction. So front axle uh, force uh, would be in this direction. This is my F X F. So this is the right angle. So this is a right angle, and uh, here I would have uh, Fx R at the rear, Fx R. So now if this is so, I can write my expression for uh, equilibrium by Newton's equation. So what is that is in front tax, the entire uh, vehicle weight can be uh, taken as Wf and Wr and uh, uh, when I look at the free body diagram of front axle wheel, I would write an equation. Rear axle wheel, I'll write an equation. So that equation is going to be equated to Wf into V squared by Rg. Is what is in the front. This effect force is because of unbalance present in the lateral direction. So that would be equal to uh, Fyf. This is Fyf. Fyf cos delta minus of minus alpha f. See, this is positive and this is minus. So this difference is what is this angle? 
So that's what I should take. So if I see that, I should extend this line. I should extend this line. So this angle here is delta minus of minus alpha f. Right? So this is going to be delta plus alpha f. So why cos is because I wanted in this direction along this line. That is what is my component. Perpendicular to that is what is uh, now this fx. So this and uh, uh, it's perpendicular to being paid, but what is that I wanted is again uh, in this direction. So that to get, uh, if I extend this line here, so this angle is going to be again same as that of delta plus alpha f. So that's going to be fxf cos or sine, sine delta plus alpha f. So this is that. Uh, uh, equation number one and the front axle wheel free body diagram. From the rear axle wheel free body diagram, WR into V squared by RG is what is my centripetal force, and that's what is equivalent to the resultant in this direction. So, how do I get? Let me just extend this uh, line and extend this line. So, this angle is again here alpha R, sorry, alpha R. alpha r and this angle also is alpha r this is alpha r so now i can write here this expression why in this direction so what is that it's turning the centripetal force is directed along the radius of curvature so along this line it is directed so i get those component and that component is equivalent to this so that component here would be uh, I, I take this positive because inward towards the center of Turn. So that is uh, in this side, it's a phi r uh, cos alpha r and uh, fx r, fx r sine alpha r. Right? So now uh, this is my equation 2. So this equation I can rewrite, and finally, what is that I require is I know steering angle requirement for steady state uh, would be. 57.3 L by R, this is the Ackermann steering angle called for low speed cornering. And in hard cornering, it is funded with this uh, effect, uh, or this alpha F minus alpha R. So I have to get my alpha F, alpha R from this two equation and substitute in this equation capital one and get my steering angle requirement. And that would give an expression for effect due to traction. What is that uh, contributing to us understand radio? So now let us say uh, get uh, that alpha f from first equation, alpha r from the second equation. So what is that I'm going to do is, and I know that very much I'm aware, this delta alpha f and alpha r, all are very small angle. And uh, in the diagram that is exaggerated for us to understand this, right? So that is so. Let me just uh, uh, write my first equation as this. So that's WF V squared by RG equal to uh, the since it is small angle, delta plus alpha F it appears. But here it is uh, uh, when I substitute this alpha F is negative, then it is a difference. Right, the, the difference is what is that comes here. Delta is measured clockwise and minus of minus alpha f, so it's getting added here. But uh, collectively, this angle is again small angle. And uh, so cos of that small angle, it is considered to be one. So that's going to be only f y f plus here sine of small angle is angle. So f uh, x f into delta plus alpha f. And uh, let me rewrite this equation again, substituting FIF, uh, considering um, this bicycle model, so no suspension effect. Uh, and uh, here I would consider uh, as a constant um, stiff, uh, cornering uh, stiffness. So this is going to be written as C alpha F into alpha F, this expression, plus this is going to be F alpha, sorry, FXF, it's not alpha, FXF into delta plus 
fx f into alpha f on this side it is wf v squared by rg so what is required here is alpha f is what i needed so let me divide this entire uh, equation by c alpha f so what's going to happen wf v squared by rg c alpha f and here it is alpha f plus fx f delta by c alpha f plus fx f by c alpha f into alpha f so alpha f if i take out and this delta if i bring on this side delta if we bring it on this side i would be able to write for alpha right so this alpha f if i take out and this is going to be 1 plus c fx f by c alpha f and then this side it's going to be wf v squared by c alpha f r g uh, minus fx f by c alpha f into delta so alpha f is going to be W F B squared by C alpha F R G minus F X F by C alpha F into delta is all divided by one plus F X F by C alpha F. So this is equation number two. Sorry, three. So this is an expression for uh, what is that slip angle in terms of these expression, and you see that now in this expression, I also have the steering angle here, and I also have my F X F. What is the drive force that is in the front axle? So this is alpha. X. So similarly, from the second equation, I can write for alpha r. Uh, what is my second equation? Second equation uh, is W. R V squared by R G. That's equal to. That's equal to cos. Uh, uh, what is that? F I R. F I R cos alpha R. So cos alpha R is one. F I R is C alpha R into alpha R. F X R. So this is going to be uh, C alpha R into alpha R plus. Uh, uh, here it is. F X R into sine alpha R become only alpha R. F X R into alpha R. So uh, again here alpha R again get uh, this F X R. What is the expression of uh, this? F X R into alpha R. So again let me uh, divide this alpha R I require. So let me divide the entire term by C alpha R. So W R V squared by C alpha R into R G. And here it's alpha R plus F X R by C alpha R into alpha R. What's going to be alpha R into one plus F X R by C alpha R. So this is uh, uh, equation four. This is equation four. Uh, uh, instead of writing this is four, let me just get alpha r, and that is uh, equation four. So alpha r would be now w r v squared by c alpha r r g divided by one plus f x r by c alpha r. So this is the equation uh, four. So I have equation three and four gives me slip angle and. Uh, Slip angles in the front axle and the rear axle, so that now I can substitute them in my equation capital uh, Roman letter one. That is delta equals 57.3 L by R plus alpha F minus alpha R. Substituting them and uh, again manipulating. What is that you observe here is on the right hand side you have a delta term here also delta term. You have to take them group one side, and uh, also the fact that uh, uh, F X F by C alpha f is very very small quantity. Why? Because uh, f x f by uh, is very small attractive force. f x f by 
C alpha F, uh, knowing that it's very, very uh, small, lesser than much lesser than one small quantity, you can have uh, your expression changes in a convenient form. So let us derive that uh, uh, expression uh, just now, right? So let me substitute uh, 3 and 4 in this equation. So it's 57.3 L by R, L by R plus alpha F. Uh, what is that we had? Alpha F, WF, V squared. So this expression, WF, V squared by RG, C alpha F minus FX F by fxf fxf by c alpha f into delta this entire term divided by 1 plus fx f by c alpha f minus wr v squared by rg c alpha r divided by 1 plus fx R, so this is FXR and here it's FXF by C alpha R, here it's C alpha F. So what is delta? So now here this delta term is there, that day you have to take it on this side. So if I bring that on this side, uh, how is it going to change? It's going to be 57.3 L by R plus WF V squared by C alpha F R G by one plus F X F by C alpha F minus W R V squared by C alpha R R G by one plus F X R by C alpha R. And here it is going to be delta plus F X f by c alpha f into delta divided by only for this 1 plus fx f by c alpha f because this is common to the system. So this is that term. So now you see here, uh, since uh, we know that uh, the value of fx f by c alpha f and fx r by c alpha r is which much small value this ratio less than one i can write this one plus fx f by c alpha f as one minus fx f one by right one by this as one by one plus x if x is very, very small quantity, 1 by 1 plus x is 1 minus x, and then I can write as a series. First two terms I can take, remaining I can truncate. So I can rewrite this expression as 1 minus fxf by c alpha f. Similarly, 1 by 1 plus fx r by c alpha r can be written as 1 minus fx r by c alpha r. So making use of this, advantage and I can uh, uh, do this uh, manipulation here further. So what would happen on my left hand side is this. What would happen on my left hand side? Let me put this. So this is going to be delta plus fx f delta by c alpha f and this is going to be 1 minus fx f by c alpha f. So this uh, this is one left hand side L H S right. On this side, uh, uh, let us have these two terms. These these three terms are there. So this is there here. This term here. So this term, if I work out further, uh, it's going to be delta plus uh, f x f by c alpha f into delta minus uh, f x f square by c alpha f square into delta. So you can neglect this term as uh, squared already this ratio is smaller value. Uh, so this can be eliminated and uh, that's equal to I have here three terms. So now this is going to be written as 
if I take delta out, it's one plus fxf by c alpha f. That's equal to here 57.3 l by r plus I have these two terms. What are these two terms? Is uh, this again? Uh, uh, you see that uh, in one by one plus f x by c alpha f. I use this, and these two terms are going to be rewritten as like this. So first term is W F B squared by C alpha F R G into one minus F X F by C alpha F minus W R B squared by C alpha R R G uh, into one minus F X R by C alpha R. So that's going to be 57.3 L by R plus, and here I have first term here and first term here. So if I group that, it is going to be WF by C alpha F minus WR by C alpha R into V squared by RG that I will take it out. And the minus, there's minus term here and there is plus term here. So minus if I take it out, it's going to be WF fxf by c alpha c alpha so c alpha f square minus w r fx r by c alpha r square this is all as a common term outside i have v squared by r g and in this side i have delta is the one plus fxf by c alpha f so this delta is now corrected by this though this value is going to be a very small value uh, but uh, you have you have my requirement of delta is now more uh, compared to that of the uh, governing equation that comes because of your fxf is introduced so this is your expression now so in this you see now very interesting uh, you, you see this is your uh, term where it is due to tire compliance. Whereas this term is now coming from tractive force. <clears throat> and here this FXF and FXR. FXF is drive force in front axle, FXR is drive force in rear axle. That represent what? It can be a four wheel drive. It is representing that wheels, all wheels are driven wheels, drive wheels. So you get your uh, traction there. Supposing if we are considering now, if you are considering now, so this is K due to tractive force, right? So if we consider now uh, the front wheel drive vehicle, the so front wheel drive vehicle will have FX R0, right? FX R0. So you will not have this expression. So front wheel drive here, it's positive. But what is happening? This minus sign says that if we have front wheel drive and you have lateral force in the front axle, that contribute to oversteer tendency. That means it will pull the vehicle. Uh, engine pull, it's said. So you will have an oversteer tendency. If you have your uh, FX, F is zero. FX, F is zero means what? And the FX R is there, that means the rear wheel drive vehicle, rear wheel drive vehicle. So in a rear wheel drive vehicle, when FXF is zero, look at here now, if this FXF is zero, this is going to be delta, and your requirement uh, is going to be, so this minus into minus become plus, so that's going to be an understeer vehicle. So that is what front wheel, front engine mounted front wheel drive vehicle may, go for an oversteer tendency at the contribution, whereas rear wheel drive vehicle where FXF is zero, FXR is existing, so that would be here, and this term is zero, and you get this positive, and already you have your uh, understeer gradient here, plus this getting added, so you would get, have an understeer effect. You would have your understeer effect. So uh, you can also see that uh, uh, this FX, uh, whatever I have put, it's not only the tractive force that you should assume. If I take my front wheel drive vehicle, 
uh, um, um, this is not necessarily to be zero. Rather, you can consider in my expression, Fx R is going to be my rolling resistance force. Like that, you can consider because there is a force always existing. So the one which is uh, uh, driving wheel, you have a drive force there. The other wheel, you would have uh, the uh, rolling resistance force. So you can also assume like that. All right. And uh, we have also seen that uh, the condition. You have also seen that the condition. So this is one side. If I take only delta requirement, this factor I can bring it down. So when I bring it down, the first term here, this term, 50 uh, L by R term is Ackermann steering angle, which is uh, um, very, very important for low speed cornering. So this is not, this is going to be more. So that is getting influenced by this factor again. That is getting influenced by this factor. So that doesn't appear in our previous expression when we have a steady state cornering where only it's delta equals uh, 57.3 L by R plus KUS into V squared by RG. So this KUS is what is now getting influenced by many parameters and this KUS is getting uh, influenced by uh, drive force as well that we have seen when you have a drive force you see this expression of delta on left hand side is multiplied by this factor. Right? Multiplied by this factor. So in your Giller speed textbook, uh, this factor is taken down here. That's what I, I don't understand. If I bring it down here again, this term is going to be here. Uh, and again, uh, maybe you can neglect this since it is very small. It is going to be one for these two factor and you can eliminate and you can account this is going to influence over here. Because already rolling uh, compact wheelbase and this turning radius also is finite in low speed cornering, right? That is in parking maneuvering. So when you look at that, uh, this would be brought over here, and the effect of this term on these gradients is uh, not that much. So you can see that at low speed, at low speed cornering. That's normally taking place during parking of your vehicle. You steer and you turn your vehicle. So your steering angle requirement delta is going to be 57.3 into L by R divided by 1 plus uh, uh, Fx F by C alpha F. This stop. So now <laughs> Fx F. Uh, would be what uh, in your uh, um, uh, during uh, during low cornering, low speed cornering. Uh, this term is going to be a rear wheel drive vehicle. If you take uh, rear wheel drive vehicle, this is going to be zero. If I consider, if this is zero, you have uh, uh, no problem. If this is a front wheel drive vehicle, then you have this FXF appearing here. And, uh, and this would have the uh, influence like this. And that is why it is appearing drive force applied at front wheel drive vehicle uh, uh, pulls the vehicle around the low speed maneuver, pulls the vehicle around the low speed maneuver because of this term FXF. And if FXF is negative, FXF is negative means what? Uh, FX of negative means it is the rolling resistance force you can consider. You are not braking. Uh, you, are, you are doing a smaller maneuver. You are not braking. Don't assume that's a braking force acting. Rather, there is no FX F, but still uh, you would have, if this is negative means uh, uh, that refer to minus FX F refer to rolling resistance force. That means your vehicle is a rear wheel drive vehicle. You will have your front axle wheel with this minus value. So it's going to be one by uh, minus here, it's negative value. And uh, accordingly, you would have your steering changed. So what will happen? And uh, this quantity is going to be small at that time. If it is negative, this entire steering angle is decreases. Entire steering angle, uh, sorry, this term is decreases, denominator. So entire this steering angle is increases. So that is going to uh, give you a condition of increase in steering angle. Whereas in this case, uh, um, 
when it is positive what will happen uh, you would have this term is more so steering angle required less so steering angle required less means what uh, uh, it is trying to pull that's what is pulling uh, you don't call it as an overstate effect because it is a phenomena more pronounced in high speeds we call that as an engine pull when it is positive plus fx f is positive that is what is called a pulls or uh, this uh, uh, that is a uh, engine pull engine pulls the vehicle right and uh, see we also have looked at uh, uh, the scenario of tractive force produced but uh, you have your uh, vehicle spinning when uh, in an IC surface on IC ice surface an ice surface what is happening you have your tractive force coming but uh, your vehicle is not moving forward it's spinning wheels are spinning that means what you have your uh, um, uh, cornering stiffness becomes zero that's the meaning so when this becomes zero this term is infinity this entire thing is infinity that uh, enforces that the steering angle requirement is zero and um, the radius uh, going to be uh, uh, zero. The turning radius is very, very finite and it is going to reduce and it's become zero turning radius. So this is how you should interpret this all uh, uh, the effect. So I stop at this point uh, this lecture. If you have any doubts, you can ask and uh, let's follow the instruction regarding J component, whatever uh, I have told, right? So I would prepare a schedule that maybe uh, um, uh, next week uh, according to the uh, invigilation duties that I do have for this VT. Uh, my free time, I will just get maybe today or tomorrow, you'll get the uh, timing and then uh, accordingly, I'll put a schedule and uh, it is not uh, in one day all of them i am calling i i call um, based on uh, um, the paper that you have submitted one by in a day maybe one or two batches and then i will review this will continue till the end of the semester and this interaction would be a final review there is no uh, uh, final review so the interaction what i am going to have with the batches will be final and any comments that is given you would improvise and submit back and I look at that submission and then uh, give your uh, assessment for your J component, right? So you have anything to ask, you can otherwise we'll stop at this point of time. Anything, any doubts that you have? So for uh, the vertical dynamics, I will post the video lectures in the uh, lecture channel. You can please listen to them. That is also there for your exam. And if you have any doubts in that, we will discuss that uh, once we resume back uh, next week after the week, right? So anything that you want to ask, if uh, no doubts, uh, let me stop recording.